first thing is I apologize. There's not a wireless speaker in this room, so I'm going to talk loudly. Can you guys hear me in the back all right? Okay, okay good. I want to be able to point to things, and otherwise I'll be trapped behind this. There's no way to get out. So, um, What I'm going to present to you is... is thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> is something of, of the, the literature search that I did when I was working on my dissertation, um, and then a proposal for what we should be doing to quickly get at the things that might help us to improve student outcomes, um, a, a research model for that. So I, I, I'm going to present you lots of tools. First thing you should know is that Jerry's going to pass out bookmarks, and those bookmarks have a link to this presentation um, on the back of them. And maybe if you could just pass those out while I'm starting up here. Um, so when you go to that, pre that link, you will see this presentation and all of the indexes. So you don't have to madly scribble things down. You might jot down if there's one in particular you like, um, but you don't have to um, do so much that uh, it's crazy. Because there's so much information you have, to, you have to understand that this is like a year's worth of researching survey instruments. Okay. Um, I use a lot of Creative Commons photos, so those are my credits, and my illustrator is awesome. He lives in Muskegon with me, so he has his credit too. Um, so I first want to just talk about what the problem is with educational research, and I want to start with this. Mathematics faculty will use a variety of teaching strategies that reflect the results of research to enhance student learning. This is what Beyond Crossroads tells us to do. Right. And actually, most mathematical statements, not just most most math mathematical associations, not just AMATIC, ask us to do these things in all of their standard statements. Use research to inform your teaching practice. What we what we are not told is this. Looking back over all of the research over calculus reform, Susan Ganter did a study in 1997 of 10 years of research, and she said there are a limited number of studies that document the impact of these efforts on student learning. The National Mathematics Advisory Panel in 2008, which surveyed K-12 education research in mathematics, said there is no sufficient evidence to support all-inclusive policy recommendations of any of the math instructional practices that were studied. Wow. Wow. This is a um, meta-analysis of hundreds of studies of the effectiveness of teaching math with graphing calculators. Think of how abundant graphing calculators are in our classroom. So, um, Brell surveyed I mean, I think it was 150-something studies of are graphing calculators effective for classroom use. Individual projects look at specific pieces of the picture, but the pieces do not make a coherent whole and, in fact, often seem unrelated. All of these meta-analysis studies conclude basically the same thing. We don't have conclusive evidence that something works. I'm not saying that there's not good research, but the problem is the research is being conducted in very small pockets on very distinct campuses. So for example, if you do research at a small liberal arts private religious college, and you do that on three classes at that college, taught by one instructor, that can be very difficult to generalize to a large population. That's not saying that that research wasn't excellent, but it might not be applicable to a community college student. Or research done on a community college campus might not be applicable to you know, students at Harvard. So, and vice versa, <laughs> maybe more vice versa. Um, so we have all of these individual studies, but they, they don't paint a good picture for a whole. So what we don't know, um, as it turns out, especially at the college level, we know more at K-12, but we know much less at the college level, we don't know which math instructional practices are actually effective, generalizably effective. Um, whoops. To go forward. Um, we don't know which types of students these practices are effective with. You all know that in your classroom, some students, they really just want you to tell them everything and then go from there. That's an attitude thing. We'll talk about that later. And some students really want to do something active. So which, which practices are best for which students? Um, we don't know which practices are best at which levels. And you, you all know there's a difference between your calculus students and your arithmetic students in, in terms of how they engage with the math and and their, um, their progress at, at school and how well they persist and things like that. So we don't know which instructional practices are best for those. We don't know why math instructors continue to lecture, and we all do. We all continue to lecture to some extent as a major component of courses. I can tell you this because I have research results that, that show it. And, um, and, and I don't think we should be ashamed of that because I think there's lots of reasons why. 
But I think we have to research what's going on here, and that's, that's part of my research to do that. We don't know what knowledge, it gets even worse, we don't even know what knowledge of alternate instructional practices instructors have. So we don't even know, in general, I mean, I can't even say, you know, 50% of instructors know about collaborative learning. 25% of instructors know about instructional based um, learning or inquiry based learning. Because nobody's collected that data. Now we now have a data set collected for Michigan, the whole state of Michigan. And that was my research, but I'll talk about that next day, Matt. Okay? Um, so we also don't know why, how instructors ultimately choose their instructional practices. And one of the things I study is that, in general, what I can tell you about the research, and I have to be careful not to get off too, too much or we won't get through this, but instructors know about alternate practices, they have good attitudes about those instructional practices, and they don't use those instructional practices. And that's what we call a cap gap. It's a knowledge, attitude, practice gap. So that's really what I'm studying. Um, but we need to find out why. Why do we have that cap gap? So, but, but first what we need to do any of this research is we need a common language and common measures. Because if we don't have a common language for this research and we don't have common measures for this research, then none of the research fits together and we're still stuck in this, this realm where little pockets do research here and there but don't generalize to the whole population. Now physics education has actually done a bang up job of coming up with common language and common measures that are used all across the country at all levels. They have a couple of inventories they use. They have a force concept inventory. And the force concept inventory um, provides a reproducible and objective measure of how, how a course, I'm missing an E, improves comprehension of principles. Not merely how bright or how prepared the students are, <coughs> nor what they have memorized. Okay? So what basically happens is, is the force concepts inventory is given at the beginning of a semester and at the end of a semester, and they can measure progress on this. Okay. And it's, I think, much easier in physics because they are looking at real-world situations than it is in, say, math, where we have so much abstract stuff to teach. That's not to say it can't be done. Um, what they have been able to do with, with research like this, because they can do it across you know, all sections, all colleges, whatever, is they can start to make statements like this. Interactive engagement sections have higher normalized gain on the FCI, see that, that's the Force Concepts Inventory, than traditional lecture. They have language, they have um, common measures. Okay. There's also this thing called uh, the VAS, the Use About Science Survey, and that's used to look at like attitudes of students towards science, so it characterizes um, what do students think about learning science okay, in general. And it um, assesses that relationship of the student view to you know, their outcome in the course. This is how physics has gotten so much done. Okay? So we're going to start with this. Anyone know what this number is, 28,000? This is the number of community college math instructors in the US. About 1,900, 2,000 of them on any given year are members of AMATIC, which leaves us with, somebody do the math, <laughs> 26,000 who aren't. Um, about 50% are women, which is actually great. It's not that, quite that good for the, um, the four-year colleges. 67% um, of these instructors work part-time. That's where it gets not so great. 78% of the part-time instructors and 98% of the full-time instructors have graduate degrees. So almost all of our full-time instructors have graduate degrees, but only 78% of the part-time instructors do. And you think about the developmental math classes, and we generally allow exceptions in those with bachelor, for bachelor's degrees, so that sounds about right. So let's, let's investigate um, how we can measure the instructors. We're going to look at how to measure the instructors, the environment, the students, and their conceptions. Okay, so this is the first part. We're just looking at instructors. So how do instructors approach their teaching? And the five, um, the five ways I'm going to show you are from this survey instrument called the ATI, which is the Approaches to Teaching Inventory, which was developed by Prosser and Trigwell in 1999. They're Australian researchers, and they have done fantastic research. So here's their five ways that instructors approach teaching. Um, first, uh, there are the instructors with a teacher-focused strategy. Okay. Basically, information dissemination. They want to transmit their, their knowledge, their information to the students. 
going up from that a little bit is a, a teacher who's, who's still teacher focused but have the intention that students acquire the concepts themselves. Okay. The next step up would be when there's teacher-student interaction strategy. Um, so you see we're moving from one kind of end of the spectrum to the other um, with the intention that the students acquire the concepts of the discipline. And then a student-focused strategy, sort of moving away from the teacher as the center of the classroom to the students as the center of the classroom. And so um, the teacher focuses on trying to get the students to develop concepts. And it becomes a student-focused classroom. And then finally um, is a student-focused strategy aimed at students changing their conceptions on their own. Being able to confront something, go, hmm, that doesn't work, here's why, and move on to new conceptions. So here we have uh, students trading their t-shirts, their conceptions for other conceptions. Okay? So these are the five measurements that, that you can use with this, um, with this ATI. I'm going to back up here for a second. Whoops, no I'm not. I must have missed a path. Um, this has 16 items on it. It's a, it's a Likert scale. Simple, one to five answers. Um, it, it basically gives you two scales at the end. How high you are on this conceptual change student focused index and how high you are on this information transmission teacher focused index. Okay? So for any instructor who takes it, you can basically get kind of a measurement of where they fall in terms of student focused and, and information transfer focused. Um, so that means that if you can measure that, that you could measure a change in that over time. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple of example items so you have some idea of how this looks. Um, here's one of them. I'll read it for those of you in the back because it might be small for you guys back there, I'm not sure. Is it okay? All right, I'll let you read it then. So this is aimed at which one? ITTF or CCSF? ITTF, ITTF right? It's aimed at figuring that one out. Um, here's another one. Here we're looking to involve students a bit more, right? We're moving towards student focus, kind of in the middle of that. Um, again, starting to focus on student conceptions again, so you can see how it's moving across the scale. So um, you can classify based on those two scales where, you, where people fall on these, on these five items, okay? So that's a great index we could be using, that we're not using. It's very well developed. Okay, so that's how instructors, that's how we could measure how instructors approach teaching. Um, so I said we needed a common language, and what I found as I was doing all this research was that we call all of our instructional practices different things in every research article, which makes it all near impossible to find all of the research that might fit together in one place. Okay? So uh, one of the components of my research went, before I even started was to come up with a list of what we should of what I was going to call them and what those were clearly defined as. So I went to the literature and I, where I could, I found literature examples and then I um, wrote down um, classroom examples for what those would look like, both technology based and non technology based. And then I sent that out to, um, I, I surveyed 50 instructors to get a sense for if they thought those needed tweaking. Okay? So this is the result of literature and tweaking by 50 college instructors. Okay? So the first, I'm just going to go through the first five of them, and you can look at the rest later if you want. But so the first one is lecture. So what is lecture really? Well, what we determined by all of this uh, uh, tweaking was that it's um, giving a presentation on some subject for a period longer than 20 minutes. Um, it, it, it may include questions and answers between you and the student. That's still lecture because it's still teacher to student. Okay. Um, the key characteristic of lecture is simply that students don't interact with each other. You talk for 20 minutes at least and students don't interact with each other. That's still lecture and that's why I say that we still mostly do it. Because a lot of instructors say, well, I ask my students questions, but that's still teacher to student. Okay? So the next one um, that we've been starting to use a lot in math is mastery learning. and. Uh, this is, I'm going to read this one. This is, sorry, there's so much here I'm reading to you, but there's just so much stuff I can't memorize it. Sorry. Um, designing summative assessment checkpoints into the instructional program 
where the student is tested on their mastery of a single topic or subtopic. So think about all these online homework systems we're using, lab-based environments, things like that. The instructor may coach students during class time or outside of class to help students who struggle. Um, students don't receive partial credit for partially corrected uh, responses, or for partially correct responses. So mastery-based is kind of an all or nothing. You either get the credit or you don't. And so most of this online homework that we're using is essentially mastery-based. Okay, the next one is a collaborative lecture, and this might feel more like what you do for some of you. A collaborative, and this is interesting because this came out of our, a lot of our discussions, and there was a literature base for this one. It's teaching by giving a series of short, focused lessons intermixed with student-centered activities. So that would mean that the students are talking to each other. It's not me talking to the students, it's the students talking to other students. Um, and those student-centered activities solidify concepts or lessons to introduce the next short lesson. Um, and so again, the, pr the primary difference between a collaborative lecture and a lecture would be that the students are interacting with each other at points along the way here. The next one is cooperative learning. What we also call it group learning, we call it collaborative learning, we call it all sorts of things. Um, but this is including class time for learning that engages students working and learning together in small groups. Now there is some overlap between these, and so they have to be measured, each one has to be measured as kind of a percent. How much do you use this, right? Nobody uses just one strategy, well I won't say that. Some people use just one strategy, but most of us use a combination. So cooperative learning is learning that's designed for students to, um, to engage actively in the learning process. This is really tough to distinguish this from inquiry-based learning, but inquiry-based learning does have a few characteristics that make it separate. Um, the guiding principle in inquiry-based learning is that instructors try not to introduce the topic. They try not to tell students about the concepts until after the students have worked. In group learning, they might introduce the topic first and then have the students work in a group on something. Okay? So those are five categories. We also have a layer on top of that. We sometimes have specific focuses in our class. I'm not going to go through each of these separately, but you can go read the descriptions. And for each of these descriptions, there's also examples to help you kind of pinpoint what category you might be in to make it easier as a survey instrument. Um, so we sometimes have an emphasis on application problems in some classes. Uh, some classes have an emphasis on writing, communication skills, presentations. Um, some have an F emphasis on formative assessment. Multiple representations would be like um, when we do the whole, you can graph it, you can do it with algebra, you can do it with a table of values, you can do it with writing. And then we have project-based learning as well. So we have all these other things we layer on top. So that gives us a common language framework. The next thing we look at is the environment. Because it's not just us and the students, it's the environment we're in. And they were smart enough in Australia to come up with an index to measure this as well. And so the things that go into this, that come out of this index are, you know, is there departmental support for teaching? Do you feel like there's departmental support for teaching? Do you feel like somebody else has control of your teaching or you have control of your teaching? So that comes out of this index. Uh, enabling student characteristics is kind of like, do you feel students are meeting you halfway? Are your students ready to succeed in your classes? Or are there things getting in the way? Because that's the environment that you're in, right? So if, you, if the students are, are not doing their homework, or not coming to class, or are not engaged in the learning process, then that's enabling st student characteristics. Um, and this is interesting because 68% of us, of community college faculty, Say we report some stress from teaching underprepared students. So I think this is a good one to measure. It's kind of surprising it's so low, isn't it? <laughs> the next thing that, this, that the environment test measures is um, appropriate academic workload. Are we all overworked? Do we have too many students in our classes? Are we teaching too many sections? That will impact how we teach. So this measures that. Do we have appropriate class sizes? Because will that impact how you teach? Yeah. You betcha. Do we have appropriate learning spaces? You want to do group work, but you're locked into rows. You want to do work on computers, but you don't have them. So we have to measure this too. And this, this, this instrument does that. 
And um, th this, I quote Prosser and Trigwell a lot because they really are, they've written a fantastic book. It's called Understanding, Learning, and Teaching, and you can buy it on Amazon. It costs about $40. And it summarizes all of their research. It's very well written. Um, I'll just let you read this a second. What's the book called again? Understanding, Learning, and Teaching. This is the thing I think is really going to be really scary for us. All the research points to this. That students have to have independence in learning to get to deep learning. And we'll see what that, that, we'll go through a little bit more of that in a second. But independence in learning is not something that will be easy for math teachers to embrace. We all know that at our community college level, if we just said, go home and do some homework, what would happen? <laughs> yeah, disaster. So we have to figure out how to do this. I'm not sure how, but we will figure it out. I'll show you how. Okay, so that's um, called the Perceptions of Teaching Environment Inventory, PTEI. We could use that to measure the environment, okay? I want to show you how they, they build these inventories, because I want you to understand that these are very well-researched inventories. So this is how they build these inventories. They start with understanding the problem. So they ask an open-ended question to a large population and look for commonalities in the results. So for example, one of these inventories was developed by asking the question, you haven't seen the inventory yet, but this is the question I asked. Think about the math you've done so far. What do you think mathematics is? So they just asked students this very open-ended question. Sorted through all the results of those questions and came up with commonalities. So they look for patterns in what people say. They develop a pool of questions that they think represent categories. They have multiple researchers. Once they think they have the categories, they give all of those statements to multiple researchers and have them categorize them to make sure that the categorization is consistent. So your patterning has to match your patterning. Otherwise, it's not good enough yet. Then you pilot that inventory with a large population and you check for internal consistency, reliability, and you perform factor analysis to make sure that's a decent survey. If it's not, you revise. Okay? So all of these surveys I'm showing you have been through that process, okay? After you revise, you pilot again. You go twice with the same group of people, with time in between, to make sure it's reliable, that people don't wildly vary when there's been no intervention in, in the middle, okay? And then there might be a little bit of final tweaking after that. So all of these inventories have been well-researched, okay? They were researched in Australia, some of them in Europe, but with English-speaking populations of students at the college level, same types of courses we teach. So we should not reinvent the wheel, I think, because we don't have time. <laughs> so next we get to the other number, which is 1,700,000. And that's the number of community college students we go through in one year in math. So let's look at students. Students have a perception of their learning environment. Will a student feel differently if they go to a high school classroom to take their math than if they go to a college classroom to take their math? Will they feel different if the environment has round tables or the environment has 300 person lecture hall with rows? Same thing as us, yes. Okay. And on, it turns out that there's kind of a spectrum here. On one end of the spectrum, um, Students kind of, kind of perceive their environment, and if they, on one end, they say this is a really heavy workload, there's not much freedom of, of, um, of uh, choice in this learning. On the other end of the spectrum, they can say, you know, there's some choice in what's learned, there's some flexibility, there's some um, clear awareness of goals and standards. So those are the two ends. I'm going to come back to this in a second and talk about it more. But this, this can be measured with something called the Course Perceptions Questionnaire. Okay? And it just links students' perceptions of their environment and their quality of learning together. So how do students approach their learning? So now this is like, you know, what, what do they think about learning, basically? And so they have two approaches, a surface level approach. And a surface level approach, they think that tasks are being imposed on them. Think about our, most of our math classes, right? They take a surface level approach to learning, and they think tasks are being imposed on them. 
they don't have any purpose or strategy to studying. They're just they're like employees. They're like poor employees, right? They do what they're told, and that's it. Well, they don't even do what they're told, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is a surface approach. I'm just going to get through this class, okay? The other side of the spectrum is a deep approach to learning. When they can see the relevance of what they're learning, um, they seek to develop understanding of what they're learning, and this is in the research shown to have a higher quality outcome. If students have this approach to learning, they have a higher quality outcome. Okay. Meaning they go on to more classes in that subject area, they get better grades. So if they can approach learning deeply, they're good. Okay. You can, I'm sure you're thinking, through, you're sorting through your classes right now. <laughs> Surface level, deep approach. So it turns out that how students perceive the class is directly related to this. They perceive the class as, you know, an environment as being one where they have no choice, no freedom, anything else, they take this approach. If they perceive the class uh, as a place where they have some freedom and, and, and there's some awareness of goals and flexibility, then they're more likely to approach the class like that. And that Could the arrow be the other way? What? Could the arrow be the other way? There's all sorts of relationships yeah, here. Yeah, okay. So you're going just one way. So yeah. I'm just wondering if that's the That's direct. the study that I read that pointed this way. Okay. The research could be done to point the other way, too, yeah, I'm sure. And maybe it has. I just maybe haven't read it. Okay. So we can measure um, students with a study process question. There's, there's like three more things we could be using, and we can investigate all of these. There's a study process questionnaire, which gives three orientations, surface level, deep, and, a, and a, an achieving level, like kind of our high achievers in classes. Um, it includes, uh, it, this one's actually designed for higher ed, and there is a K-12 version in case you're interested. Um, it's called the Learning Process Questionnaire, and you can look at all this later, I promise. If you click on any of these things, you can actually see them closer. Okay. So there's something called the ASI, which is the Approaches to Study Inventory. It has 52 questions, and it looks again at deep strategic or surface level learning. There's something called the ASSIST, which is the Approaches and Study Skills Inventory for Students. If you're teaching developmental students, I think you ought to take a look at this. Because one of the things it measures is a surface apathetic approach. Mm -hmm. And that approach measures this kind of stuff. Fear of failure, lack of purpose, bounded by the syllabus, unrelated memorizing. How many of us have seen that in our students? If I just memorize enough formulas, if I just write enough on my note card, I could pass this class, right? So this, this index would help us to measure that. And that was called the assist. Okay, we can also measure student conceptions of learning. Um, and there's a survey um, for this as well, or there's a paper on this, and some, some uh, indexes which I just showed you. Um, and on the, this is the two ends of the spectrum here. On one end, we have a quantitative increase in knowledge. They think learning is increasing their knowledge. On the other hand, <coughs> they think that learning gives them an understanding of reality. So this is kind of, this is kind of again, the two ends of the spectrum. This is one in particular that I love. I've used it now. Uh, this is called the Student Conceptions of Mathematics. This is what students think math is. That question that I showed you earlier, what do students think math is? So this comes up with five conceptions of mathematics. I'm going to back up for a second here. It puts it on a scale between a fragmented, or it gives you two scales. How do they rate on a fragmented conception of mathematics, and how do they rate on a cohesive scale of mathematics? And here are the five conceptions. The first conception is that math is numbers, rules, and formulas. Okay, and here's the cartoon, because I know you're going to want to see it. The second is that math is numbers, rules, and formulas, which can be applied to solve problems. So we're moving up a little bit. And here's the cartoon. <laughs> the third is that math is a complex logical system, a way of thinking. So you see we're moving across the spectrum. The fourth is that math is a complex logical system which can be used to solve complex problems. And here's the cartoon there. They have positively identified the radicand. And last, math is a complex logical system which can be used to solve complex problems and provides new insights used for understanding the world. 
and here's that one. <laughs> I'd just like to give credit to my husband who thought of that one. <laughs> okay, so let's do conceptions of mathematics. And believe it or not, it turns out that this relates almost directly to that surface level deep approach. If students have a high fragmented level here, guess what? They have a surface level approach to learning. And if they have a cohesive conception of math, this is what they think math is, then they take a deep approach as their kind of standard action. So what I'm saying here is that we might be able to use this just to measure where there are changes. You know, do it at the beginning of the semester, do it at the end of the semester, do we have a change in conception? That might lead us to know what might be working across all math teachers everywhere. Okay, so that's called the CMQ, Conception of Mathematics Questionnaire. Um, it's again a Likert scale, 19 items, very fast to take. It takes about five to 10 minutes. Um, it gives you these fragmented and cohesive scales. And I'm gonna show you some of the example items here. Whoops, I guess I don't zoom in on those. So mathematics is about calculations and students just agree or disagree basically on these scales from one to five, right? So mathematics is about calculations. Mathematics is a logical system which helps explain the things around us. Mathematics is like a universal language which allows people to communicate and understand the world. So remember this index was developed after looking through thousands of responses to the question, what do, what do you think mathematics is? Okay. So these are kind of student language centered <laughs> items. Okay, so next we look at um, how could we measure the subject of mathematics? Because of course grades vary from school to school, the curriculum varies from school to school, so how do we standardize that? And we have some <laughs> mathematics concept tests under development, although I'm not going to claim that I've, I haven't even seen this one. They're not easy to get a hold of. And this one's supposed to be under construction, and I have seen this one. And I'll show you the sample question on it. And the sample question, let me see if we can get a little closer. There you go. I'll let you read the sample question. So you can see how that's getting at concepts. The only problem is when I actually looked at the CCI, I didn't see that in the test so much. Right? It, to me, it felt a lot like just a calculus test. So I, I'm not sure I, I like it as much as I like, say, the force concept inventory we have for physics. Um, so there might be a need here for us to, and like I said, I haven't seen this one, um, but it, it is out there. And I don't know if that, does anyone know if this one has actually been developed now, or is it still like in limbo somewhere out there in the world? You can see pieces of it on the web. Can you see pieces of it on the web, but has it actually been finished? I don't think so, and I think they're actually calling part of it the arithmetic concept inventory. The arithmetic concept inventory. Okay, so clearly we have some work to be done here. We need a common way to measure for research purposes. Okay, yes? Probably a dumb question. I think that's probably going to be answered. Is there a fee associated with these things? Or is this something you can spread somehow? The problem is that if they're research questionnaires, they're hard to get because they aren't openly published. You saw the CCI, right? I saw this one because I emailed him and I asked him for a copy and then I signed something saying I wouldn't release any of it to anybody else and then I got a copy of it to read. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll sign it too. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right, but so I think we need a way to make them easier to get at and we need to make sure that they're they're decent. And and like I said, I we, nobody's, I don't think, seen a full version of this if it exists. So it was funded by the NSF at some point but I'm not sure that that got done, okay? So this might be, need. so if you're on the research committee, this might be something we need to work on, okay? Because we need something like the FCI for all of our subject levels. What? Your understanding is that CCI, that would be something you would have to pay for, you think? It might be, I don't know. It depends on how it's funded. It depends on a lot of things. These are discussions we should have, okay? Um, so those are the other two. Um, so I'd like to end by, I hope I'm close to my time now, maybe I'm not, who knows. So I'd like to end with what I think is a solution to all of this. We have all of these concept inventories we could be using that probably most of you didn't know about. Okay? Um, the reason that I think most of us don't know about it is one, we don't get a lot of educational classes on how to measure students or instructors or the environment or conceptions. 
The other reason is because most of these indexes were developed outside of the U.S. And we don't tend to look at, we're very, the U.S., we're very U.S. oriented. Okay? Um, but um, there are little pockets in the U.S. that are developing these things, but none of them are as well developed as these are. None of them have been done to the extent that these have on thousands of students. So here's what I think we should do. One, we need to begin using common language. We need to publish that common language and we need to start asking researchers to use common language to make research more searchable and usable and interactable. Two, um, we need to design a research study that measures everything with no clear purpose except that we want to look at, we want to mine that data and figure out what's causing changes in indexes. So imagine if we, you know, at the beginning of the semester, we measure the instructor, we measure their perception of the environment, we measure the students' conceptions, the students' perceptions of the environment. We do all the same things at the end of the semester. That's it. We don't ask instructors to change anything. If you will just give us, you know, X amount of your time at the beginning and end of the semester and report those results to us with their final course outcome, perhaps, because we probably need that. Um, we crowdsource that, we design that study, we crowdsource that study, which just means that I say at AMATIC or wherever I'm at, anybody, we promote it, we say anybody who wants to participate, all you have to do is collect this data. You don't have to change a thing about how you teach. We actually don't want you to change anything about how you teach. Just teach the way you normally do, okay? And then we go in and we mine that data. And we look for which scales are changing. Right? Well, we want to see the change and say, we want to look at high course outcomes and what the teachers like for those high course outcomes. We want to look at high course outcomes and what the students were like with those high course outcomes. We want to look at that conceptions of math. And we want to look at, you know, who's improving that conception of math from the beginning of the semester to the end of the semester. Because whatever's happening there, we might be shifting those students from a surface approach to a deep approach. If we see students who shifted from a surface approach to a deep approach over the semester, <coughs> we want to look at those students and see if they have commonalities or the instructors have commonalities or anything like that. When we find those instructors, those classrooms, and those students, that's when we conduct our qualitative research. And we say, we go out and we interview those instructors, and we look at their classrooms, and we interview the students, and we try to find what commonalities those have. So rather than approaching it from a very small, you know, school here, a school here, a school here, forget that. We don't have time anymore. I don't know how many of you are achieving degree, but we don't have time anymore, right? We do a massive data collection. We mine it. We figure out who it is. We figure out what those instructors have in common. And then we target research at that. We say, all right, what if you, inter what if you have an intervention that does something that improves that, right? If you can have that intervention and measure that and you see improvement, now we're actually going right at the meat of the problem. We're going at what we think might work to start with as opposed to just throwing darts at the wall. So that's it. That's my solution. And that's the end. <laughs> still have plenty of time. I still have plenty of time. You're kidding yeah, you me. Like I never get through that early. So questions then, yes. I don't know, I just kind of had a question or a comment. Um, I was just thinking about this, how um, you'll have students in your class who take the uh, surface approach, and then they'll end up passing your class with a C. And, and then what they move on the to the next time? level, and it's even harder for them. Right. I was just, so I know, just I was, think we can measure surface approach, they get a C, they go to the next level, and they fail. What yeah. about the ones with a deep approach, and they got a C, and they go to the next level? Do they fail too? No, yeah. probably not. So here's a quantitative way to track all of this, right? Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, what is a high course outcome? We would have to determine that a high course outcome would be like, is it A or Sorry. B or? But not a standardized test. No, 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 not a standardized because we, we don't have one, quite frankly. Okay. We could do it with a standardized test if we had one, or a, a concepts test, but we don't have one. So we're just gonna have to go with grades off right off the bat and hope for something better to come along along the way. So, and I just want to make a comment. Yeah. I'm from Canada and I haven't heard of this either, so. Okay, well, so Canada's, Canada's <laughs> trick as well. <laughs> but is, it an, is there an Australian, uh, like a journal, math Yes, journal they have a field in Australia called the Psychology of Mathematics. Right. And a lot of this research comes out of that. Right, it's just like with statistics, the same thing. Yeah. That one I know about, the all the statistics works, yeah. but I didn't no, this know. Is, this is like, it, go out and buy this book. I'm not, yeah. I'm not supposed to promote things, but I have no stake in this whatsoever. 
go out and buy this book and read it cover to cover. I will. Because it's fabulous. Uh, it just goes through all of the research studies, step by step. They did this, then they said, hmm, I wonder what would happen if we did this. Oh, it sounds hmm, nice. I wonder what happened if we did this. And they just, they just moved on to like have an index for everything. Yeah. Which book was it? Were you just talking about this? Understanding, learning, and teaching. Yes. Um, do you know, by chance, um, besides the uh, physics education field, mm -hmm. how they were managed to standardize their language, do you know how they went about doing that in your career professional organization? Or um, I think it was because they started with a force concepts inventory. And when they did like their version of calculus reform, they all used the force concepts inventory. When we did calculus reform, we didn't have anything similar to tie our research together. If we had when we did that, I think we would be a more cohesive research body too. So I suspect it was just that somebody had the foresight to have a way to measure, and we didn't. Yeah? How would we incorporate the idea that a lot of times the students that are left over, and talking about surveying mm -hmm. the beginning and surveying at the end, the students that are left over are the ones that are being successful, and we're not, we're not measuring them again at the same survey because we lost maybe 18%. Let me show you something. The second link on your, um, on your page is what we just developed last week in our math department to get at this exact problem. Um, it's called the, I don't know if I can find it easily, um, the Student Effort Index. So that second link will bring you to this. And, and we haven't tested it, but we thought we need a way to measure students who are no longer there at the end. Especially when we look at pass rates. Is the instructor responsible for the pass rate of a student who only attended class twice or never did any homework or never engaged? And so what we thought we would do is create a, an easy way to measure that. And so what we created was an index that measures um, frequent assessments, that's like homework or discussion boards or quizzes or whatever, attendance, or if it's an online class, logins, and you determine how many logins is a full participation, major assessments, which is exams, and I'll tell you what's, why sincere effort is there in a second. So unfrequent assessments that were attempted you measure zero, one, two, or three. With three being, you know, they did greater than 80% of those, and zero being they did less than 20%. Uh, attendance or logins, we decide that attendance should be greater than 90%. And then going down the scale, less than 50%, you're basically not there. Um, major assessments, if they took them all, they get a three. If they took all but one, they get a two. If they took all but two, they get a one. Otherwise, they get a zero. If you missed more than two exams, you've basically checked out. Um, and then this last week, that was only a nine point scale, we really wanted 10. <laughs> so we decided that the instructor should be able to have some judgment in here on whether, because you know the students who come to class but they are not engaged, they put their heads down on the desk and they sleep. We thought the instructor should have some way to weigh in on that. And so the last point is just a yes, no. It's did the student put forth a sincere effort? Yes or no. And that way if the student did actually attend but didn't do anything, I mean, didn't participate, didn't talk to anybody, didn't put their heads down, read the paper, texted during class, they can get a zero there. So that was our last point, because we thought that, that was important, to, but we didn't want to have a whole scale, because we wanted it to be difficult. Either you feel they have put forth a sincere effort or not. So what we're going to start doing is tracking this, so just one score from zero to ten, along with their course outcomes, because what we think is that... Um, if you look at, um, if you track, say, course outcome, which would be their grade with, or if you have a standardized test, it could be that, with um, the student effort index, that maybe instructors shouldn't be held accountable for the, the students who are on the left side of this index. Because how much influence can you have over a student who is not, not putting forth effort in a class? That means you're going to lose the higher, high outcome, low achievers as well, but probably those students were misplaced in the class. If they're getting a high outcome but they put forth no effort, there's pretty much only one way to do that. Either the instructor's grading too easily, which is something we should probably look at, or the students were misplaced. And that actually puts us into a population of being able to figure out which students were misplaced easily and go look at the data for placement scores and things like that to see why that, why that population is that's happening to them. Right? So we figured that by breaking this out separately from a grade, we could actually do a lot more valuable research on something like achieving the dream or whatnot. Because if I want to measure pass rates in my classes, I want to measure pass rates in the students who had at least a five on that scale. I think that's fair. They should have to meet us. We we take a lot of effort forward to meet them. They have to take some effort forward to meet us. 
And that, that's what we should be measured on, because the ones who have made some effort, you know, it's surprising. Yeah? I just was wondering if you had ever had the students fill out a form like that, you know, asking them how much homework have you done? Well, our evaluations ask them to rate how much effort they put forth in the class. Oh, do that. The student perception of their own effort is really interesting. Yeah. If you've ever asked your students at the end of the semester what their perception is of how much they've missed class, it won't match up with your attendance record. Yeah. And they can't calculate percentages besides that. So they'll be like, oh, I only missed 10% of class, when in reality they missed 40% of class. You know, so somehow percent equals times they missed, you know, so oh, yeah. to them. So, yes? Um, I, I've used this a couple times in my teaching methods, and I ended up making up my own surveys, and I was just wondering what, how many people had actually done that, maybe some validation or not, but just kind of get, having a workshop bringing what we had well, these are not necessarily, well, for one thing, I've met Trigwell and Prosser, and they're very nice, and they'll, I mean, the thing, the way to design it is to have one person or a group of a couple people design the research study, ask the researchers for permission to use their indexes, and, and then that's all been done, right? Not, you don't all have to individually ask. That research can just be passed down to, because we're all so busy, right? Not everybody has the time to develop these studies well, and that's the thing what we're running into. That's why we have no good research. So let's pick a few people who can do it, have them organize a really fabulous study quickly, quickly, because we all need it, um, and push, push it down. And I, I would hope if that happened that most instructors would choose to participate, because, I mean, we'd only need participation for maybe one semester if we had enough. All that data would get pushed back. We do an analysis. We would know what what to start looking at for real, as opposed to just kind of taking these guesses that we've got right now. Yeah. When do we start? Now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we should probably. Yeah, I think we should probably do it. I think it's something that you know the board proposes a lot of, or organizes a lot of grants that AMATIC applies for, and I think in reality we ought to have a we ought to apply for. I mean, I almost don't even want to apply for a grant because it's so cumbersome to apply for a grant. It'll push us back another year. But, you know, we could start doing the work on writing what the research study would look like while we're applying for the grant and then use that. Because we need somebody to coordinate the, the, you know, telling people what to do, answering their questions, and then pulling all that research back in. Right? So there's got to be somebody who's given quite a bit of time to deal with that. If you can imagine there's 1,800 community colleges in the U.S., um, that could be a lot of data if instructors want to participate. And within Achieving the Dream network of schools, I would think we could at least get those schools to all participate, and hopefully a lot of others, because the more that participate, the better the data will be. And that's why I don't even, it's a data mining experiment. It doesn't need to be a random sample. I think we go for as much data as possible, because it's a fishing expedition, essentially. Um, but it would be better research, I think, than anything that we've, we've done yet because we could maybe find out what the problems are and fix them and have a massive amount of data to show what the problems are. I mean, imagine if the problem turns out to be, you know, instructors that don't have enough time and we have a massive amount of data that shows that. And you could go to the, le the legislature and your administration and say, look, this, this is what this research study showed us. You know, that would be incredible. Because they like data, right? All this no child left behind and everything else. They claim to like data. They might not like what the data says, but we could measure everything we need to. Yeah? Well, you said the outcomes would be the grade in the course. For now, we would have to measure outcomes as grade in the course because we don't have a concept inventory for every level. But I mean, wouldn't it be the grade in the next course? We could measure that too. Or completion of the. There's no reason why we can't, you know, I mean, it sounds like some of you are interested, so what I propose is that we write a research proposal at the same time we're writing a grant. It'll take a little bit of time to organize exactly how it should be done so that it's a minimal amount of time for instructors and students. I mean, the instructors could take the inventories the same time the students are taking the inventories. I mean, we could make it pretty painless. Um, and, then, uh, and then they have to do it again at the end. So you have to get instructors to buy in that this is important enough that they will spend maybe half an hour at the beginning of the semester and half an hour at the end and report all that data back, which would be one extra reporting they'll have to do. Um, but if it all comes in on spreadsheets and it can all be organized, then we're good. And I'm out of time now, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> we'd like to thank Maria for her, on behalf of Amatic. We'll give you oh, thank you. Well, uh, that's my collection. If you have an evaluation form, please just leave it on the table. If you came in late, did not get the handout with the web address for this data, I still have some. And uh, 
give her a round of applause. And if you all thank my husband, he videotaped the whole thing so that other people can watch it. I will put that up on my website as well. <laughs> <laughs> this arm is probably tough.